belong to, we are children of because of the faith of Abraham that still runs in us. So we bless your name even today as we uh, come once again uh, into the perfection of priesthood. We thank you so much for the precious uh, gift of your instruction that continues to grow in us the knowledge and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, may you be a love, honored, cherished, and praised and adored now and always. And on this day of, of Pentecost, Shavuot, Lord, may you count us uh, in as that part of uh, whom you called the Segula, the very special chosen treasured possession for your namesake. Amen. Now, three times a year, Deuteronomy 16, 16, we have read this in, through the time of our study together as a family at Jam. Maybe uh, we have made reference to this scripture, if, if not 300 times, and talked about it at least 150 times. And, you know, yet I can tell you uh, with a fair measure of certainty based on my correspondence throughout the church, is that more than half the church don't even know these three feast days, all right, that are commanded here in Deuteronomy 6, 10, 16. And sadly, throughout the church age, this may be the case. It's because we, we have lost the priestly attention to priestly details. And uh, we have gone into a faith that's more like a religion rather than a relationship with God. We being children who are priests, we have to handle the priestly knowledge. So congratulations to those of you who, who actually understand this scripture, it's so central to the life of Israel and so central to the life of Israel of God, that is you and I, that we have to understand what it means Three times a year, the adult males, 20 and up in Israel, had to show up at the temple in Jerusalem at Passover, which is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread as well, because it begins the seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and also the Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, which we are familiar with. And notice how no one must appear or should appear before the Lord empty handed. In other words, uh, this is a very serious underlying statement of God that when we come before God, he wants to see us bearing the fruit of our relationship with him. So everyone must appear with a gift as he is able, but he is reasonable. So for the is people of Israel, it was something that they physically had to bring out of what they have grown, what they have raised, what they have earned. According to the blessing Yahweh has given to you. But in spiritual terms for us, we not only give materially and uh, you can say functionally our, our giftings, but we especially uh, show the fruit of our obedience by giving to the Lord, a measure of Christ, a growing measure of Christ likeness. And that's not something uh, uh, to be easily set aside. That's something uh, that must come from our, our life of walking with the Lord, a, a truly faith filled and faithful life. But sadly, a great part of the church until this day do not understand the centrality of this command by the Lord, because Passover, Tabernacles, and in between uh, Pentecost, they are appointment dates with the Lord, just like the seven uh, feast days of the Lord, right? And so uh, Feast of Pentecost, you can say, is right in the middle of the seven feast days of the Lord, which are really appointment feasts dates with the Lord. The word mo'ed or mo'edim in the plural refers to these feasts. Yes, it's a celebration, a gathering of the people before the Lord, but it's for the purpose of meeting face to face. So they are appointment feast days. 
Why? Because God wants to see that the children have grown in standing, in stature, and grown in fruitfulness, and carry the heart of thanksgiving and gratitude to show forth for it. Today we're looking at event history and prophetic history in the Old Testament and New Testament. And if you open ears of your heart to hear, uh, you, you would appreciate the beauty and the power and the importance of Shavuot. This feast, we call it Pentecost generally in the Christian church because when it was uh, translated into the Greek by Josephus and some of the early uh, translators, yeah, they, they used the equivalent of 50 uh, days, right? And so it was translated that way and the church comes to uh, use that name because the church really grew out of a Roman Latinized culture. So this Pentecost or Shavuot is celebrated on the day after the 49 days of daily counting of the Omer, a measure of uh, the first fruit of the, ha the barley harvest was taken out and it was taken out and separated out, taken out. And they are kept, and they are kept so that usually when they see the ripening of uh, these grains, uh, the very first ones, they would tie a string around. Some of them would tie a string around. So these are marked to be taken out as a portion. And um, only after the 50th day are they really allowed to kind of access that to eat and other purposes. Now remember, uh, much of the Old Testament and the, the dating is based on the seasons of the agricultural year because God is using nature to reflect the growth in the people and the community as well. So, so when we come to Jesus, he uses a lot, a lot of nature to describe also the growth of the kingdom of God. So this is how God communicates in language that we are familiar with. So you can see uh, the, the language of God's real heart and purpose and plans, even in the landscape, even in the agricultural produce and the agricultural seasons of the year. There are five biblical names in Hebrew in the Bible to describe this holy day. Now, the word holiday, we call it now, is really a holy day, a set apart day. So there are seven holy Yahweh's appointment feast. So Passover and then at the same time Feast of Unleavened Bread and the third day afterwards the Feast of the early first fruits or the smaller first fruits which is the Hali, Hali harvest and then the fourth one is this one the Feast of Weeks or also called the Feast of Harvest or it's called the Day of First Fruits so we know this is the Day of the Greater First Fruits because now the wheat is also ripening and harvested, right, during these uh, days leading into uh, this 50th day. And then it's called the first fruits of the wheat harvest. And it's also called the day of assembly. Very important, Deuteronomy 18, 16, 18, 15, God said that he will raise up a man like himself, a prophet like Moses, who speaks face to face with God, and that's referring to Jesus. And then immediately the next verse tells of that this is the day of assembly when when they spoke before God, right? And so these are very, very, or God spoke to them and they were before God to hear his awesome words, to receive the uh, the, uh, the law at that day. And uh, now there is a sixth name and they really uh, came uh, into the most prominent place for the Jewish uh, faith culture up to this day. It's called the season of the giving of the Torah. And so now they really based it out of Deuteronomy 1816 because after the destruction of Herod's temple, the second temple, no one could bring there 
offerings to the temple itself, physical temple. And so they begin to uh, re, what do you call, vision this day as the day to celebrate the giving of the Torah. And so you find up to this day, all over the world, Jewish uh, people and communities, they will spend all night just reading the Torah. They read the book of Ruth, especially because it's also the agricultural season kind of a, uh, uh, a narrative. And so they are reading and they're eating cheesecake <laughs> and so forth, <laughs> fueling their the physical body so that they can last through the day. So they are just feasting on the word of the Lord because they now remember this as that. Now in our uh, Protestant church, uh, when we come to the day of Pentecost, we only talk about the Holy Spirit descending, right? But we, we perhaps miss some of the larger um, implications and even the beauty that is preserved by the memory of Jews down the centuries is a season of the of God giving the Torah, but now it's a season of God giving the, the Holy Spirit, but specifically giving the utterance of God, right? The word of God. Just like the one that God sent from heaven, John 3 tells us, speaks the words of God and God gives the spirit without limitation. In other words, give the words of God without limiting Jesus, right? So the words of God is the spirit of God. So when we pray, Holy Spirit, work in me, we are asking for God's presence to work in us by his will, by his word. So yes, the Holy Spirit, we can say, is God himself, but God himself specifically as he's able to with us and work us through his word, his real presence working in us. So that's that's how we relate to that. So Pentecost uh, is the 50th day and it's the day that Jews to this day, they commemorate it as the day or the season in which now uh, we remember how God gave us the Torah at Mount Sinai. Now we will examine Shavuot, which is the Hebrew name, uh, Feast of Weeks for our uh, name Pentecost through a quad focal. Now, some of us have bifocal lenses. Like this one is bi bi bifocal. So the upper portion, I can see far, the lower portion, I can see near, right? But now we're going to put on a four focal, a quad focal, and look at four very important aspects of uh, Pentecost. The Old Testament event history from Exodus 19, the Old Testament prophetic history from Joel 1 and 2. You can read actually the whole of Joel, but these are the passages I'm quoting out from only. And then the New Testament event and prophetic history. Look how I've joined the event and the prophetic part of that history together for X2. And then finally, God's prophetic promises fulfilled. Okay, so the Old Testament event history. We look at this season. Now, we are told in Genesis 19, that at the beginning of the new month of Sivan, they came to Mount Sinai. So apparently they spent a few days just preparing. And so uh, from the detailed studies of some scholars, uh, especially from the, the rabbinic tradition, generally 1916, this day is the day when you, you look as uh, the sixth day of Sivan. So they, they came and for about six days, they were around the mountain and Moses had some initial conversations with the Lord. Uh, but really it was on, on this day that uh, we remember as six of Sivan or rather the Jewish uh, rabbinic history remembers it as a six of Sivan. This is the day, all right? If we can argue, well, isn't it the third of Sivan? Okay, that's fine. So, but we are just remembering it with now the Jewish tradition. Uh, who who spent a lot of energy often to, to nail down the exact moment uh, of the beginning of the first day of the month, the beginning of the first fruits. So they, they try to be as precise. So we respect 
bet, even though uh, it may be given for uh, some you know, give and take. So, but what we see here, and I've organized this uh, event day, historical event, uh, into uh, five main uh, themes or motifs so that we can better understand uh, this, the key, the key uh, points, the most important points, uh, lessons that we learn on this day, and then we see it also uh, against the New Testament event history later on, all right? And we want to keep in mind uh, their similarity and their differences and understand why. Remember, our study of the Bible is from the perspective of sons of God, not just ordinary school children or, or playful ones, you know, are never coming to anything serious. We study it seriously, and that's why we pay attention and we organize the instruction given to us into uh, what we call frames so that we can see them better and so that we can, of course, apply them with understanding. So we see in Exodus 19 from verse 16, the third morning there were thunders, lightning, cloud, and trumpet voices, and smoke, and fire, and quakes. Very, very physical, very, very visual. And it shakes everyone physically, the whole congregation of, of the massive congregation to their core. Uh, this is what has happened. But here the people are gathered to meet God, right? The people are gathered to meet God. What happens in Acts 2? The people are gathered to present offerings to God on the day of Pentecost. Here, they are not gathered to present offerings to the God. Primarily, they are gathered to meet God. And this is the first time that God now is going to uh, do something, give them his word collectively. All the days leading up to this, it was only mediated through Moses, the word of the Lord. So very significant. Now, verse 19 to 20, we see and hear a deafening trumpet blast. And amidst the blast, very surprisingly, when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder. So at the, the point of the greatest blaring of the trumpet, Moses spoke. Now, you would think that, you know, last night we were doing ministry at Sozo event and parts of when I was praying for the people one by one, sometimes the music was really loud and I had to raise my voice so that the one that I'm praying for could hear what I'm saying, right? Whereas in this case, you, you, you have a situation where the trumpet was so loud and yet when Moses spoke, well, Moses was not a very good or eloquent speaker, so he presumably is not a loud speaker. And yet God heard and answered him by voice. That's beautiful. So that, that tells us that when we really speak to God, he hears. No matter the noise, the volume around, good or bad. All right? When we speak, God hears and answers by voice if we are in that place of relationship with him like Moses. Then I am came down Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and I am called Moses to the top of the mountain. So there's a meeting place between the heavens and the absolute earth at the bottom, and it was at the peak of the mountain. I am descends upon the mountain, Moses ascends to the mountain. Uh, we always must meet God, right? We cannot usually uh, expect, especially when we come into a place like Moses, all the more when you are already a Christian, I've already been a Christian and a minister for so many years, we have to uh, make our part to climb that mountain. Only when we are so weak where we, 
we are lost totally, whatever, and then God may come us and find us by the wayside. But when we have been found, so there's no excuse for Christians to always feel I'm so weak, I need this, I need that, I need to be so this, I need to be pet, I need to be this, I need to be pampered. No, then you never grow up, right? So uh, pampering spiritually is not uh, the best way for us to understand how to be sons of God. So grow up, right? We have to get up and get going. We have to do what we can. And so, um, so then in this moment, the voices of Moses and Yahweh, I am the Lord God, they are spoken in a, an effective um, dialogue. Now, the next we see here that the holy boundary markers being set. Because now the, the, the priest and the mount itself are being made holy, are being consecrated, are being set apart just for God. This is very important because in our Protestant faith, generally, we almost have no boundary markers. We can disrespect anyone and we can uh, we can just dismiss anyone, whether it's the least member of the congregation or uh, the one who stands over the congregation. You know, I've noticed this thing over the years. This is very, very tragic because it betrays a lack of priestly understanding and the respect of God's boundary markers. You know, we should repent seriously. But here we see clearly, I am said, Go down, warn the people, don't let them break through to gaze at me, or many will perish. All right? So there is a holiness of God. There is uh, a part of God that is so set apart that only uh, some can even approach. Now let the priests who come near I am consecrate themselves. So in other words, uh, at this time, the priesthood was not fully established, but the heads of the household, as I've taught this many years ago, were generally regarded as priests, that they are representatives uh, before God of their family. So that notion has carried down from Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob, right? So the one family head stands before God like a priestly figure. So let the priests who come near I am consecrate themselves lest I am break out against them. Again, they must really make a, a clear uh, decision in their heart to set themselves apart for God, to respect the holiness of God. So they are not going to uh, do the things that would make them uh, unclean or, or make them just like the people. If the others are not serious, the priests have to be serious, right? So the priests have to know the moment and understand that they are before the living God. And Moses said back to I am innocently, yeah, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai because you already want us set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. So Moses said, I, I, I got it. I actually got that because you already said that. But you see, it's so important that Yahweh had to remind Moses to warn the people again. And then we come to uh, Moses and Aaron, uh, their summit summoned. They are summoned to the summit, to the top of that mount. The priests and the people are segregated, all right? And they are being uh, boundary marked and warned, right? So I am said to Moses, Away, get down and then come up, you and Aaron with you. So, so Yahweh is replying to Moses, yeah, I know I said it before, but go down and warn them again, basically. But however, get, uh, bring Aaron with you. But don't let the priests and the people break through to come up to I am, lest he break out against them. See, he underlined that and speaks that again and again. 
So respect the holiness of the Lord. Respect the people he set apart. Respect that you are a set apart people and you have a place and you should occupy that place. And then immediately at the end of chapter 19, we come to chapter 20. There is no chapter division in the original text. And then God spoke all these words saying, and here we have the Ten Commandments. All right, so this is the giving of the Ten Commandments and you go read from 20, 21, 22, 23, 20, into 24. You have many other of the commandments that God would give them as he makes this, seals this covenant by the blood of animals. All right, and uh, ordain this sacred moment or this, this time in which the Torah is given almost as a covenant contract with the people that he has chosen. So that's the event history. Now, I put here, uh, I've just added this, uh, all that I am has spoken, we will do. It's found in 199, 24-3, 24-7. All right? Very significantly. Here the people says, all that, that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. Now, if you go to the Pentecost in the book of Acts, the people, even the good and holy and devout people who come there, all right, uh, they were not there expecting to hear the Lord speak at all, right? So, but yet the invitation or the, the, the cry goes out from Peter, and the apostles is for the congregation to now hear that the Messiah of Israel, the prophet who is like Moses has come and he's crucified and you are to now receive him and believe in him. All right, so very, very important contrast. Let's go to the second aspect or focal a vision of the Old Testament prophetic history. So instead of the Old Testament event, which happened on the 6th of Sivan, before and after that, 50 days after the, uh, the Passover here, uh, we have a moment in prophetic space and time by the prophet Joel, who prophesied the day of the Lord. So Joel chapter 1, 2, and 3 really speaks about the day of God's judging the people and what happens, the day of the Lord. And he pictures it, as you see here with locusts, right? So I've quoted from the New King James, uh, New King James Version, and they, they, they call it the chewing locust, the crawling, what the chewing locust left, the cr swarming locust has eaten, what the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten, and what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. So locusts, locusts everywhere. And they are to tell the children from generation to children, tell your children about it. So we have also lost the understanding and the reverence for the day of the Lord, right? So for us, it seems that the day of the Lord is some great, happy, uh, cheerful coming uh, in the future of Jesus from the skies. That's how the, the main part of the tradition understands it, right? But in the Old Testament times, thinking about the approaching of God, the day of the Lord, is a fearful time. Have I got my house in order? Am I ready to meet uh, when God's judgment come, whether I pass the test or I don't, whether I'm saved or not, or destroyed by his wrath. So the theology of how uh, uh, the day of the Lord works is very powerfully expressed here in uh, Joel. And of course, we can see it in Zephaniah and we can see it in many other huge sections of the prophets. Now, verse 14, chapter 1, they're told to consecrate a fast and a sacred assembly. All right? And to gather the elders and the people. So consecrate this fast assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of land into the house of Yahweh your God and cry out to Yahweh on the day of the 
the Lord. So here we are introducing themes that are bringing us into the book of Acts, the Pentecost in the book of Acts. Alas for the day, for the day of Yahweh is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. It's not the food cut off before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God. And verse 20, and, and when we go into chapter 2 and verse 28, and you can read in between, it's a very powerful narrative of the day of the Lord. But when we come to verse 28, this is our most familiar passage in the book of Joel because it's quoted directly by Peter in Acts chapter 2. And afterward, now what is that afterward? Is it after the day of destruction? A particular day of destruction? So, but when you examine Joel 2 and then go into Joel 3, before Joel 2.22 and after uh, Joel uh, 2.29, uh, 2 right? Be after, before and after this, you realize that it's talking about a day of the Lord that surrounds this, this scripture here. So alas for the day of the Lord is the day of God's judgment, which is at hand. Now, when, when the kingdom is announced by John the Baptist and by Jesus and by the apostles to each town of Israel, they are announcing the day of the Lord that the kingdom has come. It's the day of the Lord that ushers in this kingdom of God. And we must make this association that it is Come, it is even in our midst, and judgment has begun in the house of the Lord. How? Jesus went out to call out sin and commissioned his disciples two by two to the towns of Israel to call out their sin and the rebellion and to return to the Lord. And it all started John the Baptist. But we fail to make these connections because our traditional faith, by and large, is very ahistorical, and we pluck the real historic moments and events out of the lives of Jesus and the apostles. And we just apply it in every subsequent generation saying that it's speaking to that prophetically. It is not speaking prophetically into the future. It is speaking to their time, their space. It's a real historical event for that day. But we read on that we are told of the prophets anointing now this is very significant because in the old testament times only the ones who are set apart as prophets that god would call to himself even moses even aaron even miriam and later on we have of course uh, joshua is a prophet samuel even david is a prophet right but there's it's not everyone it's just not everyone and there were very few females, but there were, right? Deborah is the best known in the Old Testament. So, uh, of course, Miriam was, but Deborah was called a prophet. So, but here we see that the prophet's anointing is going to be given. It's almost like it's, the anointing is a mantle, you can say. Uh, the Lord putting oil or putting a recognition and authorizing this person to carry the prophet's witness, your sons and your daughters. So it cuts across gender, which is okay. Maybe there were exceptions, but now sons, daughters are placed alongside sons. But what is amazing is the age group, because young men will dream dreams, young men will see visions. So it cuts across also age group, right? And the most amazing thing is it cuts across the class barrier. Even my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So even those who are slaves, even those who, who don't uh, have class and categories. So that's quite amazing. But you can hear uh, all this beautifully being expressed later on by Paul in several passages in his epistles in Christ is you know there's no distinction between male or female Jew or Greek right even masters and servants so that's speaking to that 
I will show wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. And we may be tempted to think of it in a very physical way. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of I am. So this is the, all the scriptures quoted by Peter in Acts chapter 2. He's quoting Joel 2.28 to 2.30, right? And then the last panel here we see is the person of salvation, the person who is to be saved, and the place where the person is to be saved. These are very specific. Verse 32, and everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh, Yahweh, save me, Yeshua, is Yahweh's salvation, will be saved for on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance as I am has promised among the remnant called by I am. So there is a, the cult remnant of I am. Now this random terminology has been abused, wrongly applied to almost Christians today who are super spiritual, right, or down the ages. Well, the New Testament, when they talk about the remnant, they're talking about that at that time before the destruction of Israel under the Mosaic Covenant, the final, the greatest day of destruction. The remnant are those who are faithful to cry out to God for the sins of Israel. Just like the ones pictured in Ezekiel uh, chapter 8 on, right? The ones who really cry out for the sins of not keeping the commandment. So if we want to apply it down the ages to Christians in general, we should not apply it to Christians who are just eager or zealous or enthusiastic, right? We should apply if we want to apply that as an equivalent, it would be Christians who are really crying out that the commandments of God are not listened to, obeyed, and followed carefully. And that brings sorrow to God. And that does not bring any good to the community except the wrath of God. That's the remnant. It's not those who feel entitled, oh, we belong to the remnant. We are, we are super Christians because we intercede a lot, we do all these things, other things a lot. But if we're not crying out because the words of God are not loved and respected and defended. And we see uh, the lack of seriousness with, with engaging with God's instruction. Then we don't really fit that category called the remnant. We come to the third uh, focal lens, which is the New Testament event and prophetic history in Acts uh, chapter 2 and going into chapter 3 as well. So just now, uh, Vivian has done an excellent job reading out this passage, but we see first the commotion of wind. So it's on a much smaller scale right now, not like at the mount of around Sinai where everywhere they felt and heard and saw and even could smell the smoke, right? But here there is a whooshing of the wind. Right? And uh, from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were. They were just sitting down in the house in the upper room. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire or cloven tongues. All right, that's the word used by Clean James cloven tongues of fire, cloven tongues, fires. Very interesting, right? It's not just fire on the mount, it's inside the room, and you see this little fire shaped like tongue, what is it speaking about? It's speaking about the word that comes from God who dwells in consuming fire. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So don't expect that God divides himself individually as a Holy Spirit in each person. But God is giving his word, his Holy Spirit himself, right? his instruction that is going to pour out of them. And when God really stirs and takes over that tongue, 
the Holy Spirit, the Holy Breath, the Holy uh, Presence of the Lord comes out and they were speaking, right, utterances that was not under their control. But note from verse 5 down to 11, uh, the confused devout, right? These are religious, truly, truly devout, truly pious men of Israel. Of course, some of their families, the women folk and children may be with them. But these were the devout ones. These were the serious ones. And they have been called out of Jerusalem, from Jerusalem, yes, but a majority come from outside of Jerusalem. And we know uh, from scholarly uh, research and, uh, you know, uh, surmisings that probably up to a half a million of these foreigners who are Jews living in foreign lands have come here. And at this moment, they were the specific ones that have come into the place around the upper room. They were in the place, and we must understand that God in the Old Testament has prophesied in different passages that I will call one from this place and one from another place, and I will call them from all these places, and I will assemble them in that day when he's going to do a second exodus, when he's going to reinstate the people into possessing the real house of Israel. So there are many passages in the Old Testament speaking to that moment when God will bring back his scattered children one by one. So he picks the name. So we must respect the, the fact that the 3,000 that day who, who gave uh, their heart and now surrender their will uh, and believe in the Lord Jesus, they were handpicked by the Lord. But yet this, all of them, all right, uh, they were confused. Because they are hearing out of the mouths of these apostles the, you know, their own language. And of course, they were speaking how God has come to fulfill, right, what he has promised. And so they were hearing uh, things pertaining to, uh, to what God is doing and will be doing. They're hearing things, but they cannot process it because they're too shocked. And so they came to the force or the nature's response to this situation. They were so amazed. And that's the four panel here. Uh, and perplexed, they said to one another, whatever could this mean? But the mockers, the ones who don't take it as seriously, they said, well, they're full of new wine. So, uh, so the, usually uh, that language or of, of mockery uh, uh, comes out something false, right? So they only could say that this is drunken speech, <laughs> that they're not even thinking. Drunken speech and it sounds like our own dialect, right? So so we, we see this very powerful picture here. And then finally, we come to the fourth panel, God's prophetic promises fulfilled. So we want to see how Peter stood out as the new leader. Jesus had told Peter, after you have fallen, kind of denied me three times, and then when you turn around, you you encourage the brethren. And Jesus in Matthew 16, right, uh, also told him that you are Peter, right? And that upon this rock, I'll establish my church, and I'll give you the keys uh, of to the gates, the keys to the kingdom so that the gates of Hades death will not prevail. So Peter was set apart as the one who is going to take over the leadership of the 12. So we find in, in Acts 2.14 that Peter standing with the 11. So with the council, this is the council of the 12 apostles. This is the reconstituted family of God. The real family of Israel who are willing to come into the everlasting covenant. They will come to respond to the council of the 12 apostles who will take uh, this family faith uh, into all of Israel and then uh, even into the tribes of the nations of the earth, not just the 12 tribes of Israel. So he called out men of Judea and, uh, you know, listen to my words, 
these ones are not drunk as you suppose it's only nine o'clock in the morning but this is what was spoken by the prophet joel and this is so important because conference after conference uh, uh, different prophetic teachers will say, well, we we now really come to the fulfillment of Joel uh, 2 right now in our day. All right. And so what happened on the day of Pentecost there is just a partial fulfillment. Well, this is a, an arbitrary uh, and uh, an, an unallowable division of partial and filling. Because if you say that it is only when we come to the 20th, first century, then there's a full fulfillment. Then what about all the centuries in between? I mean, God forgot about them and God kind of put a halt and, and shut off the spigot so that no more water flow, right? No, it's, it's ridiculous. You see how our popular theology actually uh, runs so many ridiculous circles that are not meaningful to us. And so sons of God, daughters of the heavenly Jerusalem, awake. Listen to the word of God. Be bold. Be bold. Just like Paul stood up, even confronting all the other apostles as well. He says, if anyone preach a different gospel, let them be anathema. All right, be cursed upon them, even unto everlasting uh, uh, consequences. Even if the eyes brought you a different gospel. Now, we need uh, to understand apostolic faith, faithfulness, and courage. Because we are going to miss what the scriptures actually say in so many places if we are in fear of men and tradition. Look, the tradition of Pentecost is celebrated by a part of the Christian church, especially the Pentecostal and the Kashmir tradition, as though Pentecost is really about uh, all about speaking in tongues and being baptized in the spirit. That's all it's brought down to, speaking in tongues and and so the effort is, is still going on to try to make everyone receive this gift of speaking in tongues. Now, although the motivation is not wrong, the theological focus is, is out. The theological uh, uh, point is out of focus. And so we end up producing generations of people even who speak in tongues, but walk in great sin and rebellion. Right, and who see many visions, but they don't understand how to work with those visions. And they begin to teach all kinds of uh, teaching which depart from the word of God. So that's our problem because we don't have clear theological focus. You know, I want all of us to remember this. Gem, we have been set apart. And I have been given a, a particular vocation calling to teach the word of God confirmed by different witnesses and I confirmed by the Lord himself. And so I take this very seriously. And that's why uh, I, I had to really oftentimes push through with courage and ask people uh, around me to pray because I had to uh, share things that will offend some parts of the church, even some of uh, those that I've led in this congregation. But do I want to fear offending and fear men rather than dishonor the Lord and fear the Lord. No, I, I need the courage not to sell out the Lord. And by doing that, I'm also betraying the brethren. And so, so with all seriousness, I'd like us to remember uh, that, you know, what the Lord has given to us and has been recorded for us uh, really, we must seriously engage with it. We don't just come and fish for what we want to know and how it pleases us, how it comforts us, and how it, uh, it is going to make us happy or make everybody happy. Then we are men pleasers. We are self-pleasers, right? But we want to please the Lord, and we want to give one another what it is, the real, the true, uh, the, one, the things that come out of our heart, out of our conscience, uh, that is aligned with God. All right, so um, Joel's prophecy was fulfilled at that season of that Pentecost. 
the time when Jesus had asked the apostles to wait there and to pray for the coming of this, when God's word, instead of being spoken out from Mount Sinai and only mediated through Moses so that the people were so afraid and said, what Yahweh speaks and we will obey, now the word of God is spoken out through living witnesses. First with the apostles, the 12 apostles, and then with the 3,000, they begin to now be overwhelmed by the word of God that is speaking out of them. That's a very powerful movement. Why? Because God is, is also doing that as a sign and a wonder to speak against the unbelievers in Israel. And the majority of Israelites then and today and down the centuries are unbelievers as far as God is concerned. And the Lord Jesus has those that he has chosen and who are pointed not only to Joel, like Peter points to Joel, and he quotes the whole passage, shall come to pass in that in, in the last days, I'll pour my spirit on all flesh. Now, your sons and daughters, he's not talking about all flesh and in meaning in that he's pouring out onto all of the humankind, because surely we know it didn't happen, right? Because the the Pharisees who reject him, the Sadducees who don't want him, or the Indians who don't know about him, the Chinese who have no clue what's happening halfway around the globe. Right? So we have to contextualize it. It is the sons and the daughters and the young men and, and the old people, the young and the old, and the slaves and every age class in Israel, the ones who are chosen. And we know that only a small part of Israel, a small part of Jerusalem, had the pouring out of the spiritual tongues out of them, not all of them, right? And so now, of course, Peter finally points to Jesus. And the four things he talked about in the verse 38, he says, repent. So there's repentance. So turn around. Turn around. There's a need for repentance. Now, at the first Mount Sinai Pentecost uh, encounter, there was no calling for that repentance at all. In fact, the people were all too eager to say, we will hear the voice of the Lord. But now the people of God have come to such a place that most of them would not want to hear even the, the voice of the Lord and to repent. And Peter also told them that, look, why you must repent or why do you want to perish through the rest of the house of Israel? Because God is coming to judge. So if you reject the one that he has sent, who is like Moses, he will cut you off. He will kill you, basically. That's what Peter said at this assembly. Repentance is for the house of Israel here to turn back to the fathers, to Moses, and then to listen to the words of Moses and to now listen and respond and believe. So it's still the theme of the baptism of repentance because he says the baptism right away, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's a very powerful theological concept that we will visit. What does it mean to be baptized in the Lord Jesus? We will cover it at some later session. For the remission of sins, remember, when Jesus blew out the last breath to heaven, he gave up the spirit on the cross. Later on, when he resurrected, he came to the disciples. He gave his spirit, his breath again, and breathed into the, the 12 and the few others gathered in the upper room and said, receive you the Holy Spirit. All right. So, uh, the apostles had an earlier sign, signature, sign and wonder moment, and now uh, it's, it's, you can say, a greater, more prominent signature, sign and symbol moment. Uh, again, first through the apostles, this time is instead of Jesus breathing upon the apostles, now the apostles are breathing out the words of God, and then the people who were chosen, the devout, uh, the men and women who were chosen to come to that place and who respond, they were also 
No, going to speak up with the breath of God or the words of God, the spirit of God. And of course, they receive the gift of the spirit and verse 39, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. It is a calling. It is a calling from God. And whoever the Lord calls will be the called ones. The Lord does not call everybody into this place. So we must respect of this very prominent a theological purpose of God all throughout scriptures. But because, again, with our popularized Christianity into everybody goes to hell except if you confess the name Jesus, we change a lot of scriptures. We make our scripture very inhu inhumane because it is very un-God. It is not from God. We change it. So we do not dare to do that. We want to be confronted by this historical moment in which God's promises were fulfilled prophetically. Fulfilled prophetically. So this is the Shavuot. So I pray uh, those of you, I know some of you will go over this message and or even go deeper into meditating uh, what has been laid out in a very, uh, I would say, brief manner. Um, so let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you once again uh, for your word. Uh, that has established in us the foundations of your spirit, of your holy presence in our life. May we uh, be taken deeper and higher into Shavuot, because Shavuot uh, is not just uh, uh, in our, something that works in our popular uh, imagination or church culture. Shavuot brings together uh, the historical events of history at that day of receiving the, the, the instructions from you in Mount Sinai and also prophetically through your, your prophet Joel and the other prophets who speak of that as well. And then seeing it fulfilled and enacted on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and on. Lord, we want to be those uh, who truly have come into repentance, come into true baptism with you and the true remission of sins and because we have received your, the gift of yourself, your Holy Spirit working in us because your every word is our command, is what we feed on. Thank you for listening to our prayer. Thank you for showering yourself so abundantly upon this family and uh, this family that reaches even beyond just uh, this small group of disciples gathered here locally in Greater Vancouver, but uh, into uh, a few nations of the world. And Lord, we pray that as many as you would uh, call uh, to come to receive this teaching, that they would open their ears and respond uh, with listening hearts so that they too can grow together with us according to your plan and purpose and your good pleasure in your holy name. Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance before you as he grant you the joy of truly celebrating Shavuot before the Lord with thanksgiving and praise and rejoicing, of bringing worthy the first fruits to him today and always. Amen. Amen.